Don't look at those that are above you. But look at those that are below you. Don't look at those that are better off. But look at those that are in a worse situation. And this is better that you should not belittle the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you can be grateful that you can show gratitude. And there is always somebody that is below us. There is always somebody that is in a worse situation than we are. And this is one of the one of the tools that we have. From the framework of Islam in dealing with problems and hardship, with coping with agony and pain and loss and suffering, is that we always stop to look at those that are in a worse situation, not at those that are in the clouds. Because those those, those, those that are above us, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't end. It's always someone better. On behalf of the John Jam I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, of course, uh, we have Imam John Sterling. He needs no introduction. We just want to thank him for coming out all the way from Virginia. Him and his lovely son for staying in the back. So with further ado, I'd like to invite Imam John Sterling. Not actually from Virginia. <laughs> I was in Virginia, though, a couple weeks ago. So maybe you were following my Facebook page. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi isanin ila yawm al-din yudha'an. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So thank you guys uh, once again for inviting me. It's always a pleasure when I'm here getting from South Jersey where I live to here is sometimes challenging. There's something going on with the parking in, uh, in the city now. I noticed there's commercial only zones. Is that new? No, that's not new. That's not new? I just wasn't paying attention to it when I was living here. Anyway. So tonight's topic is somewhat related to this uh, parking experience that you would have while you're in New York, and that is agony, at least calm, trying to combat agony uh, through faith. So um, what I want to do with this topic is uh, I break it down into a couple of, a couple of sections. The first is a, a story of agony as an introduction, uh, some perspective that we can gain from the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some practical advice or a game plan, if you will, towards overcoming agony and hardship, and then dealing with the result that comes afterwards. So the first story, and this story um, I found some time ago in this book. It's called Portraits of the Lives of the Successors of the Companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is Volume One. And this is a three-volume set. I don't know if it's available or not, but uh, it's a nice little book that I would recommend. It just has some really great stories in there about the Tabi'in. And they also have a series for the Companions as well, also a three-volume series. The, the, the stories are very short, but they bring in some nice points of benefit. And so the story that we're going to look at tonight is the story of one of the great Tabi'in, his name was Urwa ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. This is the son of Az Zubayr ibn al Adwan, who was one of the great companions of the Prophet and was one of those that were given glad tidings of paradise from the ten that were given good news of paradise. And his, his mother was Asma bint Abi Bakr, a Sadiq radiallahu anhu. This was the daughter of Abu Bakr, one of the great companions as well. Asma as the daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, she was also uh, a great Sahabiya and had a very, very unique position with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that, you may know this story, but you may not know some of the players in it, and that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was going to migrate and they had to sneak out of town, him and his companion Abu Bakr, Anhu, they were going to sneak out of Mecca and make their way to Medina. On 
or I guess in the middle of preparations for that, it was Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq, that came and prepared some food for them and wanted to secure it to their saddles, and so she removed her, her waistband and ripped it in half and then wrapped the food in that and then secured it to the saddles of both her father and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called her that and Nitaqain, or the one with the two waist belts. And so this was the nickname that was given to her by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as he gave many of the companions nicknames uh, throughout their life based on whatever they were doing or whatever situation they were caught in. So this was the, the son of these two great companions, Uwa ibn Zubayr. And so the story, it starts... Uh, one day in the shade of the Kaaba. They were in Mecca, of course, and he was with his brothers. He was with his brother Abdullah and his brother Mus'ab. These were also the children of Az Zubair. Az Zubair had a number of children. Uh, he married uh, eight times throughout his life. Of course, not all at the same time, but uh, some of his wives passed away. There was a divorce or two that occurred, and so there was. A large family that he had. So these these three brothers, so we have Urwa, we have Abdullah, we have Mus'ab, and then the third one, his name was Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So they were all sitting there in the shade of the Kaaba, they were chit-chatting, talking, until finally one of them said, Hey, let's let's all make a wish to Allah that we would pray that He will grant for us. As we probably do the same things from time to time. We're sitting and we're hoping and sharing our dreams and aspirations and goals. And so the first, Abdullah, he went and he said, My desire or my wish is that I become the leader of the Hijaz. The Hijaz is the region of Mecca and Medina, this mountain range on the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula. He says, My desire is to be the leader of the Hijaz and to be the, the, to be the Khalifa. The next one of the brothers, Mus'ab, he says, I want to be the leader of Iraq and Persia. And then the last one, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he said, I, he said to the first two, he says, this may satisfy your desires to be the, the, the leaders of these places, but I won't be satisfied until I am the Khalifa of all of the Islamic empire. So then they looked to Uwa ibn Zubayr and they said, what, what is your... What is your wish? What is your prayer? You know, what is your aspiration? And so he looked at them three and he said, May Allah bless you in your worldly pursuits. He says, As for me, my pursuit or my desire is that I become a scholar and that I teach my people the Quran and the Sunnah. And in doing that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shower his mercy upon me and enter me into paradise. So interestingly enough, all four of them, their prayer was answered. Or their wish was fulfilled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he became the leader of Mecca and Medina. And at one point in his political career, he was recognized as being the Khalifa. And this was in a time of political instability. After, of course, the Khulafa al-Rashidun, then there was the Umayyad dynasty, beginning with Muawiyah and Abi Sufyan, and some of his offspring or his sons became the leader after that. And then eventually the rule went into the hands of uh, Marwan, who was also from the Umayyad clan, and this is from the, the background of Uthman ibn Affan, and from his sons was Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And so Abdullah ibn Zubair was able to take the rule and make it his. And when he was appointed the, or recognized as the Khalifa, he appointed his brother Mus'ab to be the governor of Iraq and Persia. So his wish was fulfilled during that time. However, it was short-lived because Abdul Malik ibn Marwan would send his army now to reclaim the rulership and would fight and kill both of his companions or his friends Abdullah and Mus'ab and he would become the Khalifa of the entire Islamic Empire and it would have been considered the greatest empire that the world had ever seen up until that point in history.
So these were the first three. The next and the last of these four companions, Odwa ibn Zubayr, whose desire was to become a scholar, while these three were off pursuing other political aspirations, he was busy studying and learning, in particular, hadith. This was his speciality. His specialty was in the field of hadith, and because he was related to Aisha radiallahu anha, he was the nephew of Aisha radiallahu anha, he was able to acquire knowledge that many people did not have access to. And he reached a level in his studies with his, his auntie, if you will. He said that if Aisha radiallahu anha passes away and dies, then the hadith that she has from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there will not be one of them that will be lost because I have memorized all of them. He also learned from the great scholars of the, of the, of the companions, such as Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, and many of the other great close companions, Abu Huraira, which was also one of the great top three scholars of hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, Uwa ibn Zubair, he became known as a religious leader. During the time of the Tabi'een, he was from the seven fuqaha of Medina. There were seven major scholars of that period. And he was the leader in the field of hadith. And not only would the, the, the common people come to him asking their questions about Islam and how, how to apply Islam in their life and how to live, but also the, the leaders and the rulers would come to him seeking advice and counsel as to how to rule by the Islamic legislation. So there came a time when Al-Walid, we have to keep up with some of this, this is, history, this is great, this is really great history. Al-Walid, Nadul Malik ibn Marwan. So now this is the son of the Khalifa. Because at that time, this is kind of how it was happening, was the, the leadership was being inherited, like a kingdom. And so, he appointed Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, which many of you have heard that name before. They considered him the fifth Khalifa after the Khulafa al Rashidun. He was appointed as the governor to Al Medina. And when he was appointed, he called the scholars and all of the people to come in a gathering as was traditional, and he would give an opening speech. And this was done by Abu Bakr al Siddiq, it was done by Omar ibn Khattab, it was done by many of the leaders of Uthman and to the end, to the like of them. And they would give an opening address. And it also happens today. When you're appointed or, or you're voted in, then there's an inauguration and you, and you talk about what your, what your position is and what your plans are and, and all that kind of thing. So he came and he invited the scholars to come. He invited the, group, the largest and most reputable scholars to come in a very, I guess you could say, honorable sitting. And the leader of those scholars was Owa ibn Zubayr. And so, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he, he addressed the people and he told them that he would rule by the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Urwa, he got up and he made dua to Allah that Allah would give him success. That he would bless him, that he would give him success, that he would put barakah in his leadership. And you can see that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was very successful. And adhering to the tenets of Islam, as a very religious and pious leader, whereas during that time, a number of the leaders and the rulers, they had become distracted with power and worldly things. Decoration of palaces and, and the harems and you know, all these things, or the harems, all these things were going on at that time. And it's interesting to note that a lot of times, uh, a lot of focus is put on the rulers and the leaders of the Muslim countries. And you can see that this is something that began very early on, even in our Islamic history. So anyway, Urwa ibn Zubair, he was called to visit the Khalifa al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So in that gathering when he was a young man, this was now the son of the Khalifa that had to kill the other two companions become the leader. So his son asked him to come because he was a great scholar. He was a very famous scholar. And he traveled with his son, like I did today. I traveled with my son who's back there. He traveled with his son. His son's name was Muhammad. He was very, he considered very attractive. He was very handsome. He said that he was dressed very well. 
as he was going to go and meet the Khalifa, similar to my son, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. <laughs> so he goes uh, to the Khalifa, and of course, they begin to, you know, talk or whatever they do in these settings. And so his son was not interested in these talks. He was not interested in these talks with the Khalifa and the whatever. And what he was interested in was the, the royal stable. They didn't have the royal garage with all of the fancy cars and stuff, but they had the royal stable with all of the, the horses. And so he went out to look at the stable. And when he went into the stable, looking at the horses, one of the horses kicked him in the head so hard that he died from the blow. So now there's a situation, obviously, that the Khalifa is his stable, his guests, the son has just been kicked by the horse. What, is, what can you do? I mean, what is there to do? So, Oh, and Muzumir, he stayed, of course, there the night after having his son. It's one, one story that says that his son fell ill and then was kicked. Some people think that he got the ayn, the, the evil eye, like the, the eye of jealousy, I guess you could say, or envy. And this is what happened. So that night it was said that Oh, and Zubair in his chambers was there and he noticed that his leg was infected with a disease. Possibly gangrene or something. Very, very terrible infection. And so now the, the Khalifa was very concerned. He's like, he's already lost his son in my house. Now he's getting sick in my house. So he sent his royal surgeons, I guess you would say, to see what was going on and take a look at his leg and what was happening. And so the surgeons, they got up there and they looked at his leg and they said, listen, the only thing to do is to amputate. Because if the disease begins to spread, then you're going to die from it. So now you can see a real, real tough situation beyond losing his son, which for a father is perhaps one of the worst nightmares that you can live through, is to lose, is to lose a son. And now they're talking about losing a leg. And so the doctors, they said, listen, we're going to have to, you know, back then, the, the, obviously you can imagine the medicine was very crude. And the surgeries were very crude in comparison to today, right? You, you, you don't have um, an anesthesia, and you don't have fancy things, medical trinkets and stuff, but you have, you have blades and you have saws and stuff. I guess these are similar things today. So I said, listen, we don't have anything that can help the pain except for some intoxicants. You have some intoxicants that you can take like alcohol or something. And, and you'll get kind of a buzz going and you'll, you'll, it'll be very strong and, you know, you might be able to make it through the surgery and, and you can handle it. And so, oh, and Zubair at this point, he says, when, when, they, when they told me this, I realized this was a test. This was another test. After the death of my son, this was a test for me now. Am I going to give in and take the intoxicants, take these drugs, which I hold to be haram, so that I could go through the surgery? He says, I will subdue myself with the, the remembrance of Allah. And so they called the surgeons in. And he started saying, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. He started to repeat this. La ilaha illallah. And so when the surgeons came in, they brought security guards in. They said, what are you doing? What, what do you need security guards? They said, well, when we start cutting and we get to the bone, we'll have to start sawing and we're going to need to hold you down because it doesn't matter what you say, you're not going to be able to stay still and we don't want to further uh, your injury. And so they started to hold him down and he said, La ilaha illallah. they start cutting into the flesh with the scalpels, they're cutting through the muscle and then finally they get to the bone and they start sawing at the bone. If you can imagine for a moment, no, no, no medication, nothing. And he passes out. He passes out at this point. And so when he comes to, his leg is gone. And now he has to return home back to Al Medina. And on his way home, of course, uh, people are waiting to greet him in the, the, the there's, a, there's a ravine there, it's an area called Al Aqiq. Uh, that's the neighborhood that I lived in when I was there in Medina. And as he was approaching, his 
family and friends, they saw him coming from a distance, and you could imagine what they would be seeing. That here comes a man, we sent healthy with a son, and now he's coming back with no son and with a missing leg. So it looks like something terrible happened along the road. He was robbed, he was attacked, whatever. So they, he comes in there, he comes to, the, to his family and his friends, and they said, tell us what's happened to you. What have you gone through? I mean, you've gone through a, a, a trauma. It's a very traumatic experience. Something terrible has happened. And so, Oluwa ibn Zubayr, this is the beauty of the scholar, a, 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 a very righteous and pious scholar, when presented with an opportunity to blow off steam and to, and to complain and to, you know, he could really go in. I went to the Khalifa's house and this and that, da da da. He says, لَقَلَّقِينَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَدَ Quoting from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how he responded. They're saying, tell us what happened. Where's your leg? Where's your son? What happened? He says, لَقَلَّقِينَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَدَ And this is from Surah Al-Kaf, verse number 62. He says, indeed, we have met on the journey, on this journey of ours, fatigue. This is how he responded to this. This moment of hardship, difficulty, agony even. This is how he was able to deal with such a terrible, terrible affliction. Quoting from the Quran, his words did not go beyond that. This is how he expressed pain or sadness. Quoting from one of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as he's there in his house, one of his uh, companions, they come, his name was Asa ibn Talha. And he says, show me this musibah, right? This affliction, this harm that's come to you. Let me see this musibah. And so, oh boy, he pulls back the, the, the clothing over his leg to show the stump that remains. And his friend, he says, alhamdulillah. He says, you have most of you left. Right? You can imagine one of your friends coming to you and you're, you're you maybe feeling down. And you just had your leg amputated. I mean, there's no more basketball. There's no more soccer games. There's no more really walking around, running around, normal. He lost a leg. He says, Alhamdulillah, you have most of you. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you two eyes, which you still have. He gave you your intellect, which you still have. He gave you your two arms, which you still have. He gave you your two legs, and you have one of them remaining. He says, Alhamdulillah, we weren't preparing you to be a wrestler. preparing you to be a scholar and that's what we need you for so thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thank Allah that this is all that you had to go through nothing more than that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said in the hadith he says la tamparu ila man huwa fawqakum don't look at those that are above you but look at those that are below you don't look at those that are better off but look at those that are in a worse situation. And this is better that you should not belittle the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you can be grateful that you can show gratitude. And there is always somebody that is below us. There is always somebody that is in a worse situation than we are. And this is one of the, one of the tools that we have. From the framework of Islam in dealing with problems and hardship, with coping with agony and pain and loss and suffering is that we always stop to look at those that are in a worse situation, not at those that are in the clouds. Because those, 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 those that are above us, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't end. There's always someone better. There's always someone with more. There's always someone that's more successful. And when you look like, when you look, when you have this view or this perspective of your life that you're constantly looking up, then you never appreciate what it is that you have. So this story as a, a kind of introduction to the topic is a story of agony. I mean, in my perspective, this is a story of agony. It's not only uh, with family, but it's also a personal bodily suffering. Mental suffering, physical suffering, emotional suffering is going on. And someone here has to deal and cope with this, has to combat this agony. 
And as a scholar, as a learned person, they're going to use the tools that they have found in their faith to do so. Not even giving into the modern medicine that was available to them, even though they could. And there's nothing wrong with that at times if it's required. And this story is not, I mean, this type, this type of book, the books of the great companions and the great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're filled with hardships and trials. They're filled with tests, difficulties. This is the reality of our lives. That our lives are filled with hardship, trials. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ it is he that created death and life so that he will test you to see which of you are best indeed. He has created <coughs> death and he has created life to test you to see which one of you are best indeed. And in the tafsir of this verse, Imam al-Qurtubi rahimahullah, he says that Allah has created death for al-ba'th wal jaza, for resurrection and reward. That's why he created death, for resurrection and reward. And he created life in a tila for test. He created life for test. So this ayah is clear in that we as people of faith are, are more prepared than the others in the fact that we know that we will be tested, that we need to brace ourselves for impact, that we need to have tools to cope with the challenges and the hardships that we will certainly face. As it says in this verse, that He has created us, or He has created death and life to test us. It will come, it must come, this is the reality. He says, <laughs> That hardship and test and challenge, it is attached with the creation of life. And when you think about it, you think about it, the moment that you came into this life, into this world, you were struggling. It was a struggle. Your mother was in struggle, in pain and suffering, hardship upon hardship. And when you were born, you struggled to take your first breath. You fought to take your first breath. To live life, you were struggling and going through difficulty. It's either one thing or another, but there's always some form of test and hardship that we have to prepare ourselves and deal with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, often this is uh, felt in Allah's tests that are not pleasing. They're hard. Difficult things. And Allah mentions as we were just listening to the recitation before we began, it says, we will surely test you in, with something of fear, something of hunger and of loss, the loss of wealth, the loss of lives, and the loss of fruits, but give good tidings to those who are patient. So these are the hard things, these are the bitter things to swallow. Loss lacking, not having, being a have-not. This is something that everyone struggles with, regardless if you're Muslim or not. We all deal with this, and this is the bitter type of test. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test this with fear. I fear failing. I fear being a failure, not just in my classes, and my studies, but in life. I fear failing. I fear loss. Whatever I have, I'm so afraid I don't want it to be taken away. We fear poverty, loss of wealth, of income. We're afraid of that at times. Most of the time, we're afraid of those things. The loss of life. Many of us are afraid to die. We're afraid of death. And you can see how that has impacted society. You know, they're doing studies about uh, freezing the body, freezing the brain. It's called uh, cryogenics, I think. Is that right? Cryotonic. Cryotonic? Is it cryotonics? Or cryoponics? Cryophonics. 
one of those onyx with a cryo at the beginning, you got it. I study Hadith, brothers. I don't study those science things. But I did read up on it a little bit because I thought it was interesting and that people were paying lots and lots of money, $100,000 just to freeze the brain in hopes that one day science will develop enough to bring you back to life so that you can live on, live on forever. I don't know what the, the expectation is. Because there's a fear of death, the fear of moving on out of this world, out of this life, the tangible security of the world we live in. Anyway, <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse says, especially the Sabi, give glad tidings to, to the patient. <clears throat> Excuse me. The patient, those who have sabar, which is what? Yeah, patience. But what is what is patience? What do you think patience? What does it mean to you? Consistency? Or, is that what you said? Okay, anyone else? What does consistency mean? Like a thick consistency, or I know that like, what? Like steadfastness in what you're doing, not give up. Okay, steadfastness in what you're doing, not to give up, yep. Um, Sabr in Arabic is actually closer to patient perseverance. Patient perseverance. perseverance. Okay, cool, yeah. Isn't it um, patience with the, uh, with the command of Allah, with what he uh, made haram, and uh, the third one I forgot. Okay, patience with the command of Allah, with what he made haram, and, yes? I think of patience like the story of Ayyub alayhi Good, good, the story of Ayyub alayhi salam. Where he, uh, when he's sick, and he looks at, he was, he said he asked how long he was out before, or like 12 before he seven years and he was sick he was patient because basically the idea of saying like alhamdulillah when you're in their hardship that's the first response to alhamdulillah because you remember the blessings before you remember the agony that Allah has so, okay remembering the blessings before the agony having trust in Allah and accepting the current situation good good them. these are all great answers they all they all tie in together yes being happy with what you have. Not just intense or, you know, adjusted, but actually happy. Finding happiness in whatever it is that you have. Okay? So these are some good, some good starts for patience. <clears throat> there was one quote that I came across some time ago uh, talking about patience and what it means. And it's, it's kind of a practical approach to what it is to be patient. And we're talking about everyday life stuff. Right, every day, the day in, day out challenges and hardships that you go through and what it means to have patience with those things. So the first thing it was, patience, it is habsun nafs. It's the retainment of the self. The nafs, as you all understand, the retainment of the self and habs is also used for the imprisonment. Mahbus is someone that's imprisoned. So Hamza nafs is almost essentially imprisoning the nafs. He says, Min al wa which means from anxiety and anger. To, to contain the soul, to contain the self from being anxious and angry with whatever it is that you're dealing with. And this is a very quick reaction. Think about it. When you're, running, when you're running down the hall and boom, you stub your toe, what do you say? You might turn around at the door or whatever, you start cursing at the door. <laughs> right? Yeah, or the chair. On the chair, you know, it's an inanimate object. A lot of color feet. Just there. Nothing to, not, no ears to hear those curse words. But there's anger with what's just happened to you. You're actually angry with yourself for being a little clumsy, not paying attention. And then you hurt yourself. Uh, anything else? I mean, you get angry when someone cuts you off in traffic. You get angry. You start yelling. Anger. Anxiety. Right? So this is the first level of sabr here. Is to hold on to that. And to train the nafs. Right? The nafs, it requires training. It requires a type of uh, enforcement. It, it, it requires that you... Uh, that you impose upon it the soul 
or the nafs. It's not something that you just let go. Like, like some people will say, I'm not very patient. Listen, I'm sorry about what I did to you. I'm just not a patient person. I'm hot-headed. I have a temper. Okay, so understand that when we're, when we're hanging out. <laughs> yeah, and so what are you supposed to say? Oh, alhamdulillah, great. He's, a, he's an ill-tempered person. That's good. That's just the way that Allah created him. Right? He's supposed to just say, oh, justified. He's justified in that because that's just who he is or who she is. I'm just a hothead. You know, you got I got a short view, so you gotta watch yourself around me. You understand? This isn't this isn't the this isn't this isn't the the, 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 the retainment or the imprisonment of the nafs. You're letting it run loose. You're letting you're letting it's not something that you were born with or not born with, it's something that you're trained to do. It's something that you're trained to do. If you look at children, young children, they get to a point in their life at about two or three where they are very impatient. Actually, I would go as far as to say very earlier than that. They want something, they just start yelling it out. Before they can talk, they're crying. They start crying. It normally means, I want food, I want sleep, or I want a diaper change. There's no patience there. You and I, when it's when we're hungry, we can be patient. We can wait. I gotta go to class. I gotta go to work. I can put this off and wait. I can be patient before I eat. But a young child, there's no patience. Whatever urge is there, whatever feeling is there, they want to take care of it immediately. And you'll see children that get to the ages of two or three, they start throwing themselves on the ground. They start having tantrums. They start yelling and crying and screaming because there is no patience. They have not been trained how to be patient. So just like you train that child to be patient, the same thing goes with the nuts. You have to train the nuts to be patient when you face difficulty and hardship. When there's a trigger that has set you off, you have to tame that. Now, this is step one. The next step, he says, حبسل the retainment or the imprisonment of the tongue on a shekwa from complaining. Think about that. To bite your tongue from complaining. How often is it that we find ourselves complaining about our predicament? You know, this is the day, this is the daily thing for many. And we'll do it and we don't really realize we're doing it. We're complaining about the predicament that we're in. Oh man, another test. Oh man, I can't believe it. Oh man, oh man. Can you believe this guy? Can you believe this girl? What they did is to the end of it. Because you can't hold your tongue from complaining. This is a lack of sabr, a lack of patience with the situation that you're in. And the next one he says is habs al jawari. It's the refraining of the body, the limbs. On a tashwish, I'm in a tashwish. That's from like trouble, acting out, you know, acting, acting out physically. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Between the lines, you know, that kind of thing. Or whatever else, get into a fight. Right? You got so angry, so upset, you couldn't control yourself in a in a, a very difficult moment. Someone said something to you that was offensive, and so what's the next step? Someone just throws a punch. They can't hold themselves. Right? This is not this is not a, a, a demonstration of strength or bravery, a demonstration of, 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 of uh, pride to, to, to act out like this. This is a demonstration of impatience. Not being able to cope with hardship. That's a demonstration of not being able to cope. When you look at the Muslim world today, you can see on a, on a large scale a, a, an inability to cope with things. The cartoons that were drawn, the Prophet of them. The latest thing that I heard of was um, a music video with a, a, pen, a necklace with the word Allah on it, and something happens to the in the right exactly. We won't mention the name in this setting, but and the, and we're angry and 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 reactionary and and 
what do we do? And, and people will spend hours and hours ranting and raving and then to the end of it. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, that what just happened is a good thing. We say, mashallah, we hope you get a, an award for that. Or, no. But the reaction to things, how we handle things, how we deal with things, is it done in a patient manner or not? So this is something to keep in mind in how you cope with your predicament, how you cope with your, your life and your hardships that you're going through. And we're all going to go through them. And the, and the real objective here is, how is it that we go through these things? How do we cope? <clears throat> so, there's a couple reasons why we are put through hardship. Like some people would say, why, do, why, why is it difficult? Why does it have to be difficult? I'm a good person. I make my prayers on time, and I'm good to my parents. I respect my elders and my teachers. Why, why me? I don't, do I deserve? Am I being punished? Do I deserve this? And you begin to question even the very core of your faith, which is having faith in Allah's decree. And you begin to question that. Why me? Oh Allah, why me? Why are you doing this to me? Right? You're, imagine this scenario for college students. Your, your paper, your, your, your uh, research paper is, and this actually, this actually happened to someone. Your research paper is due and you have waited, like many do, to the last minute to do 25, 30 page paper, and you're just hammering it out. <laughs> yeah! Red Bull, yeah! Just bang it out. <laughs> All right? And he's like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> well, everyone's like, yeah, I did that. We've all done one of those with all-nighters. <laughs> And you think it's a, like a piece of artwork when you're done with it. You're like, this is, yeah, it's going to break the curve right here. <laughs> but right at the end, the critical moment, because like, listen, <clears throat> I have come up with a theory that these types of things, and because I have to prepare for lectures and khutbas and stuff, sometimes I'll do that, put it off to the end, because I'm waiting for some idea to formulate. Like, I need like a five-star khutbah, and I'm just waiting for it to like formulate in my mind. So we got to give it time. It's like a diamond. You know, it's like a diamond. Where's the diamond come from? From the ground. And it's about pressure and time. In order to get a diamond, you've got to have just the right amount of pressure and time to come up with the diamond. If it's off, then you just get crushed coal. Right? So when you're getting ready to look, you're hoping for that diamond to come out and something goes wrong. Look, power outage. Paper's got to be turned in an hour. The power went off. All right, how do you deal with that? How do you cope with that? Your grade's riding on it. Your semester's riding on it. This is it. This is 50% of your grade. What do you do? How do you react? How do you respond? Agony, fear, worry, anxiety, anger sets in. You might even get angry at the teacher for even assigning such a ridiculous project. <laughs> Pay my tuition. At least give me a C for merit. All right. So you say, why me? I was there every day. I was not absent once. And this so and so who was absent every time, he said to me yesterday, he already finished his paper, and he's going to get to turn his in, and I can't turn mine in. It's not that. It may be that you're being punished, and only a lot. But there are a number of reasons why these tests are put in front of us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first of those, and this is important because the first step in dealing with agony and, or combating agony, it is perspective. It's mental. It's all mental. For the most part, unless it's a physical harm. But like the emotional harm, it's all mental. It's all based on perspective. If you have the right perspective, if you can adopt and hold on to that perspective in the face of hardship, then your chances are much higher of you walking out of there not being destroyed. The Prophet Sallallahu he says, Inna idham al jazai ma idham al bala. He says that the increased reward is with the increase of test and trial. Essentially, the harder the trial, the harder the test, the greater the reward will be if you handle it as you should, if you deal with it properly. He goes on and says, In, wa inna Allah, ida ahabba qawman ibtala. 
that if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He loves the people, then He will put them through test. So it's a sign that if you're going through struggle and, and, and hardship and difficulty, while you're a good person, thank your prayers, you do your obligation, you do what's required of you Islamically, when you're going through these, these, these tests and hardships, it's a sign, and you should read it as a sign that Allah loves me. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me, and He is giving me a test so that I can increase my reward. He says, So whoever is, is happy and pleased with this, then he will have pleasure. Meaning he will have Allah's pleasure. And this is something that was touched on in the back. They said that you're happy with your predicament. Satisfied and happy with the, the decree of Allah. And when you're able to overcome those feelings of worry and anxiety and fear and pain and agony, and you can say, Alhamdulillah, this is the decree of Allah. There's a difference between just sitting down and putting it in neutral. Okay, don't get it wrong, because somebody might walk out and think, look, I don't need to do anything. It's all the decree of Allah. I can just sit down and let life go by. And I failed everything. Alhamdulillah. And then whoever's helping you go through school, your parents probably will come looking for me and they'll say, listen, you made our kid fail because they thought it was from their faith to stop doing any work. No. But when you've done your best and the results aren't there, you're going through a hardship and difficulty, then this could very well be a way to increase your reward and your status or your standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, well, then, فَلَهُمْ سَخَبْ And whoever is angry or displeased, then they will have anger and the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another hadith found in the collection of Ibn Majah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam relates, this is hadith Qudsi, says, يَقُولُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَ That Allah the mighty and majestic says, Ibn Adam, إِنْ صَبَرْتَ وَاحْتَسَبْتَ عِنْدَ الصَّدَمَةِ الْأُولَى لَمْ أَرْضَ لَكَ ثَوَابًا دُونَ الْجَنَّةِ He says that if you are patient and you are uh, uh, taking, uh, 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 I guess, an account with Allah Azza wa meaning that you're hoping for His reward during your trial and hardship, once you are afflicted in the sadamatil ula, right when it happens, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I will not be pleased with a reward other than Jannah for you. So this is very, this is challenging. Jannah, when you look at it, and you'll find in the Quran and in Hadith, there are times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he, he puts forward characteristics or qualities of people of Jannah. People of success. And you see that often those qualities and characteristics, they are not easily met. Because Jannah is not a cheap thing. It's not a cheap thing, but it's, it requires sacrifice. It requires struggle. And this is a great struggle. We're talking about stubbing our toe when we wake up in the morning. Walking or running down the hall and boom, we hit it. In the sadamatil ula, upon the onset of hardship, right when it happens, that's when you brace yourself. That's when you hold yourself. You imprison the nafs, and you find some way to cope with it, right? as opposed to the, the initial reaction, you, you're yelling and you're cursing and you're even maybe kicking that thing. And then you say, Alhamdulillah, yeah, so maybe I'll get expiation for my sins from that. Right? Alhamdulillah, after I've already broken the thing into a hundred pieces out of anger, right? And this has happened to probably most of us. You're looking for you know you're looking for something in the house. You ever lost something in the house in your own in your own place? You misplaced something. You're looking around and you start ripping through stuff. Frustrated. You're breaking your own stuff. <laughs> I'm speaking from personal experience. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Maybe you all are just a bunch of angels here, John Jay, and you just got that under control. But if you don't, then you know what I'm saying. Upon the onset of hardship and difficulty that you hold yourself. Another reason is to expiate sins, to forgive you, and to remove misdeeds. And this, of course, was reported from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Sunnah Tirmidhi. He says, مَا يَزَالُ الْبَلَاءُ بِالْمُؤْمِنِ He says, بِالْمُؤْمِنِ وَالْمُؤْمِنَ that the hardship or the trial will not stop or not cease with the believing man and woman in his self, in his own self, in his wealth and in his offspring or in his offspring and his, and his wealth until he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and does not have a sin upon him. So this 
hardship, this trial, this difficulty in life, it will continue with the believing man and the woman as a form of expiation, as, a, as an opportunity to cleanse yourself of sin and transgression. And this can continue for a person as long as they are dealing with it properly and they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any sin upon them. And we ask Allah to forgive us and part us of our sins and our misdeeds and cover our faults. And there are a number of other hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentioned, and I think it's important at this point, the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari wa Muslim, I've been hinting at stubbing the toe for a number, a number of occasions. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that, مَا مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ تُصِيبُ الْمُسْلِمْ إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهَا عَنْهُ That there's not, a, 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 I guess, a, a musibah, which is an affliction that will harm the Muslim, except that Allah will expiate them for sins. And he says, حَتَّى شَوْكَ He says, even a thorn, يُشَاكُهَا even a thorn that pricks them, that with such even the smallest of the stubbing the toe can be an opportunity for Allah to pardon you and expiate some sins from you. So this is number two. Number three is to distinguish you from the truthful and those, or distinguish the truthful from the liars in their faith. And this is directly from the Quran, so al -Anshabud. Allah says, Allah says, Allah says, do the people think that they will be left alone to say we believe and they will not be tested and tried? You think it's enough that you just say, oh, I believe in Allah the Messenger, and then you're not put to test? So, And indeed Allah has tested those that came before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come to know those who are truthful and those who are liars. It's become evident through the tests and the hardships that they're put through, it is a filtration process, right? So this is something that we all identify with. Test with hardship, failure, a loss, a death, a sickness, poverty, all that. We see that as a test. We see that as difficulty. And that is often a source of agony, a source of suffering, a source of anguish and pain for many people. But the reality is, and this is important to keep in mind, that it's not the focus of our talk. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tests us with ease and comfort. Tests us with delight. Things that we find sweet. Things that we enjoy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us with those things as well. In the Quran he says, Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul mawt. Many people, they know this verse. A portion of this verse. He says, and we will test you with evil, and we will test you with good, with the khayr that everyone's so happy with, everyone's so excited about, the khayr, fitna He says, and this will be a test. We will, we will put good, we will put happiness, we will put tranquility, and look at the test that we're in. And this is something that's often overlooked the test that we're in as a, as a people here in comfort, in warm homes, food, great coffee, cars, and everything. I mean, we're living in, we're living in abundance right now. I mean, you just look at the hall that we're in and you can see this is abundance. When you look at some of the other Muslim countries and what they're going through, some of them are not living in homes now, they're living outside. They've been forced out of their homes, they're being attacked. They're being harmed, they're being threatened. Right? This is a test for us, what are we going to do with this comfort? What are we going to do with this freedom? How are we going to use this opportunity? Are we going to take advantage of it and do something that's pleasing to Allah? Or are we going to, like many people do, and as I was looking earlier before prayer at the skyline here with all of the the apartments and everything, and I'm wondering how many people, and my son even counted how many floors one of the building was, 33 or 4 floors. How many people are in there doing something with their free time and their luxury that's pleasing to Allah versus how many are squandering away that blessing? Just thinking that, oh, everything's good, everything's happy. As a person of faith, we understand that this is also a test. 
And this can be a silent agony, a kind of undetected destroyer of our souls. Agony that we won't feel now, but agony that we will certainly feel later on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, Surah Tawbah, verse number 55, he says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْدَادُهُمْ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَتَزْحَقُ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ He says, so let not their wealth, right, let not all of their wealth or their children impress you, the delights of the world, let not their wealth or their children impress you. Allah only intends to punish them through them in the worldly life, and that their souls should depart at death while they are deniers, disbelievers. So even the good things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses as a test, and that's important to keep in mind when you're going through hardship. Is that look, don't think right now you're in a mode of test mode. Don't think now you're struggling and you're, you're dealing with difficulty that you're in test mode, but you were before that. Your whole life, it is test. You're in test mode every single day of your life. Every waking moment, you're in test mode. And so the Prophet وسلم, this is beautiful, beautiful words. The Prophet وسلم, in a beautiful, very beautiful hadith and report, Sahih Muslim, he says, li amrin muk. He says, astonishing is the, is the affair of the believer. It is the situation of the believer. Ajaban. You probably heard ajib, something astonishing, something amazing. Amazing is the situation of the believer. In the amrahu kulluhu khair. He says that his situation or his affair, all of it is good. Kulluhu khair. It's all good. Right? We say that. It's all good. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that before, so credit's due. He said, it's all good. In the amrahu kulluhu khair. وَلَيْسَ ذَاكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ He said, and this is not the case for anyone except for the believer. For the believer, the mu'min. No one else is in khayr. It's all good. No one else is really living. It's all good except for the believer. And the reason for that is because they have perspective. The person of faith has perspective on life. The perspective, it is here. He says, إِنْ أَصَابَةُ صَرَى شَكَرٍ That if... Happiness comes to him, then he gives thanks. When happiness comes to him, he gives thanks. He gives thanks to Allah. And that is good for him. And we can understand the opposite of this hadith as well. You can understand the opposite of this. And this is a principle in the Islamic legislation. And you can understand its opposite. He says here, in That if goodness comes to him, he is grateful and that is good for him. So the opposite is, if goodness comes to him and he is not grateful, then it will not be good for him. It may seem good. It may seem delightful. It may seem to be tasty and enjoyable, but the reality is, is that he very well could have failed a test. And that good, beautiful, enjoyable, relaxing thing is actually going to lead you to your own demise and destruction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you are not grateful. The next part he says, when to barra, that if hardship afflicts him, sabara fakana khairan la. He is patient. We go back to our three levels of patience. Holding the self, holding the tongue, holding the limbs. Fakana khairan la. Then it'll be good. It'll be good for him. It'll be a way to elevate his status with Allah, to increase his reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will be a way to expiate his sins. It will be a way to remove misdeed. And it will be a way to solidify his faith as being sincere and truthful, as being an honest believer, I truly believe. Because I can maintain and manage, I can persevere, and I can be steadfast in the face of both hardship and at ease. So what's the time? What's the time check? What do we got? Well, what do I got? Oh, really? Oh, good. I'm getting tired, brother. Everyone else getting tired? You ready to quit? We can stop it. I just have one more.
Two points. Let's continue. Thank you. Save me. Yeah, I was hoping you would save me. So the next part is the practical approach. Right? What do we do? A practical approach. The first one was perspective. And how we can begin to change some perspective. Perspective, as I said before, it has to be imposed. It has to be enforced. You can't expect it to happen naturally, like, oh, one day I'll understand. One day I'll be more patient. One day I'll be more grateful if there's a lightning storm and I'm outside in February and I get struck and then I'm more grateful. What? What? No. It's not like that. It has to be has to be done. Intention. Intent has to be there. And follow through has to be there. So that's number one is to begin to develop perspective. So here I have an acronym for you. Game plan. G-A-M-E. Don't forget this. Game plan. So the first one in the game plan, the G, is to gear up or to gather the necessary tools you need to overcome hardship and agony. The necessary tools that are required. And every situation, every predicament that you're in, it has tools that are universal and there are tools that are specific to that particular hardship and challenge. And the specific tools, you have to be smart enough to know what it is that you need in order to get over it. So the kind of universal tools number one, and this goes for everything, is to have knowledge. Is to have knowledge. And this is something that enlightens situations. It brings about clarity to situations. It helps us define the predicament that we're in. I'm failing a class. I'm failing a class. Okay? Scenario. It may be that my first reaction is I blame the professor. The professor doesn't like me. The professor's out to get me. The professor is, is discriminating against me because I'm a this or a that. Not my fault. But I didn't show up and I missed a couple of assignments and to the end of it I crammed into the power one house and then turned my 50% grade project. All right, so to, to have knowledge of these things and understand the situation as it is, it helps develop proper perspective. The next thing is also to have, to have knowledge of the Islamic perspective of things. And this is extremely important as we're talking about dealing with hardship with faith, with our Iman, with our, with, our, with our religion, our way of life, Islam. We're talking about facing these challenges with our faith. We have to understand the Islamic perspective. If you're sad, and you're, 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 you're distraught and you're upset and your, your life is over because your boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with you. Don't. This is real. And I'm not talking about non-Muslim community. I'm talking about Muslim community. This is, this is, this is, this happens. The boyfriend or the girlfriend dumped me. Oh my God. Oh my God. should have the, the understanding, the Islamic perspective to know that, look, this is a blessing in disguise. That this was a mistake to begin with, and now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perhaps saving you from falling further. Falling further. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saving you from falling further. And Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَخَيْرُ لَكُمْ says it, 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 it's, it's fear that you will despise something when it is good for you. And that you will love something when it is actually bad and evil. And how would you know? The only way you would know is with knowledge. That this is actually good for me. This is actually bad for me. This has been approved and legislated by Allah. This has been prohibited and deemed foul and repugnant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there again it helps to clarify the situation. The next tool that a person needs in dealing with agony through faith is taqwa. Is to have taqwa, piety, to have awe and reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as mentioned in the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah. 
الْأَلْبَابِ He says, and take a provision. Gather provision, and indeed the best provision is taqwa. To have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have the fear and reverence of Him that will help prevent you from falling into bad situations. So this is the first, the first two universal tools. Talking about gathering up the necessary tools, gearing up. It's knowledge and taqwa. And then everything else after that is probably specific to the particular situation. Number two is aid. Seeking aid. This is the A. Seeking aid. And most importantly, seeking aid in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Putting your reliance in Allah's Jannah. Humbling yourself to asking for assistance with Allah's Jannah. And this is hard for many people. I can do it on my own. I can do it on my own. I don't need to ask anyone. I'm my own person. I'm self-made. There's a pride there that can get in the way of asking for help. And this is a tool. This is a must in dealing with hardship and agony. Wasta'in billah. Of course, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, seek aid with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, by the way, this, this acronym here, it was mentioned, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in a hadith, he says, Al-Mu'minun Qawi khayrun wa ahabbu ilallah min al-Mu'min al-Da'if That the strong believer is better than the weak believer. And both of them, they have goodness in them. He says, Ihras ala ma yanfa'uk Be vigilant with what benefits you. And this is part of gearing up, gathering the tools together, that which is beneficial. The next part of the hadith is this, is sta'an billah. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk wa sta'an billah and seek aid in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And isti'ana, as mentioned by some of the great scholars of the past, they say it is requesting help from Allah. Oh Allah, help me. Oh Allah, aid me. See me through this. Give me patience. Grant me fortitude. Imam Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, rahimahullah, a great scholar of the past, he says that the servant is in need of this isti'ana billah. They need this seeking of aid from Allah in their life and after their death. In their life, he says, at the moment of their death and after they pass away, they need to seek aid with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it goes back, I think, that you mentioned before that patience is with a number of things. He says that he says to seek aid and help with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do the good deeds, to fulfill the obligations, <coughs> to seek aid with Allah to stay away from the haram, the impermissible, and to seek aid with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to have patience with his decree in this life and at the moment of your death. This is aid. Seeking aid requires us to make dua. <laughs> something that we're doing in Al-Fatiha in, in the prayer. <laughs> it is you I worship alone and you I seek aid from. I also mentioned earlier, <laughs> if Say that if my servants ask, then I am close. <laughs> I, will, I will answer the caller who calls upon me. So seek an answer for me. Ask me and believe in hopes that you may be rightly guided. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam throughout his life, and we know the, the hardship and the trials that he faced from very early on in his life until when he passed away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was never a difficulty that he faced that he did not ask Allah for help. The Prophet was always making dua. He was always asking Allah for assistance. And this is one dua that you can, you can use as a general dua to help you in your life. The Prophet says, Allahumma aslih li deen, alladhi huwa ismatu amr. So Allah rectify and correct my faith, which is the stronghold of my affair, or my predicament. And rectify and correct my dunya, 
which contains my livelihood, which contains my living. And rectify for me my hereafter, which will be my eternal abode. And make life ziyada. Make it something blessed, something extra in everything which is considered good. And make my death a moment of relaxation from every evil. A moment of relief from every evil. The Prophet Sallallahu used to make dua, and this was a very beautiful and powerful dua that a person can make on a regular basis. To help them in their struggles, to help them in their life, to bring about rectification, to bring about correction. And this is of course part of seeking aid. The next thing is might. This is the M in game. It is might. And in this hadith we started with, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ihris alana yanfa'ad billah. And then he says, Wala ta'jaz. And do not find yourself incapable. Do not find yourself incapable. Do not, do not hold yourself to be unable. Sometimes we, we disable ourselves. Sometimes we disable our own self. Oh, I can't do that. That's too much. That's too hard. That's way beyond. I, oh, you can't give up right away. That you disable yourself before you've even started. The promise of Allah says, well, not just. Do not disable yourself. Do not find yourself incapable. But you should have confidence in the tools that Allah gave you, in the blessings that Allah has bestowed upon you, that you have confidence that Allah will see you through your problems, that He will see you through your pain and suffering, that He will not burden you with more than you can handle, that you have confidence in this and you don't find yourself disabled and unable. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to pray to Allah saying, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wa al-kasr. says, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from al-ajz, which is an inability and from laziness. I seek refuge from refuge, refuge in you from being unable and from being a lazy person. And then finally you have to execute, which is the E in game, you have to execute. So the first thing you've done is you've gathered your tools, acquired the necessary knowledge that's needed for the situation, the hardship, the trial, whatever it is, the ease. You've found provisions of taqwa, of, of, of piety, and, and, and all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have asked for His assistance. You've asked Allah for aid. Maybe you even asked others who are able to help you in this world. Hey, you have a connection in the office. You can help me with my resume. You can help me study. You've essentially done all that you can do in preparation to overcome a hardship, in preparation to go through pain and suffering, You've done all you can do, and then you have confidence, might, you find yourself ready and able, and then you execute. And then you go through it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in a hadith report, Sahih Bukhari Muslim, he says, Saddidu wa qaribu. Saddidu wa qaribu. And essentially this means aim, take aim and get close. Take aim and get close. And this was explained to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He asked, what is said to do a qari? He says, it's like when you take your bow, the bow and arrow, become popular recently. You take the bow and arrow, and you draw back your arrow, and what do you do? You aim where though? At wherever, wherever you target. The bullseye, yeah. right? From aiming at the bullseye, the, if the camera there is the bullseye, I'm not gonna go like this. Here we go, to Wakana Allah. Whew. Oh. No. He says, said do take aim at the bullseye, meaning aim high. High expectations. We as people of faith, as a community of believers, should have expectations for each other that are set very high, as well as our own expectations. We should be shooting for the stars. With the problems that we face, the difficulties that we're going through, the, 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 the life that we're living. We should have high expectations. At one point, at one point, we were the leaders of the world. The Muslims, they were the leaders of the world. The companions, they, they aimed high. Their aim was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was their aim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so if you aim high, and you get close as it says, and then get close, you might not hit the bullseye, but inshallah you get somewhere close to it. 
You're shooting for 100. Some of us, when we go into the exam hall, are like, I'm going for a C. Come on, C. <laughs> C student. You know what he's going to get or she's going to get? Probably a D. <laughs> Probably a D. Yep. How many know I got a D? Yep. I didn't fail. At least I didn't fail. Look at that. That's the attitude these days. At least I didn't <coughs> fail. Or if I did fail, at least I can repeat it next semester. <laughs> I, get a, I get a redo, a mulligan. All right, so the Prophet Sallallahu is telling us this is part of the, the approach to hardship. It is to take aim. It is to aim high. It is to shoot for the bullseye. And then qaribu, and then get close. And essentially it means that whatever comes after that, if you get close, you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tawakkan na Allah. Wa man yatawakka Allah, yifal wa hasbu. And whoever puts their trust in Allah, then that's sufficient. Allah will be sufficient for them. Whatever outcome is received after you do that, then that's sufficient. Then you say, Alhamdulillah, I did all I could do. I prepared all that I could prepare. I did everything I could do to overcome challenge, to get through pain and agony and depression. I've done everything that I could do. And then the outcome is in Allah's hand. And that is the outcome of every aspect of our life. It is all in Allah's hand. Your life, your, your lifespan, your breath that you take is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they breathe in knowing that they will breathe out, but they never do. Knowing that they're going to exhale, but they never do. All of that is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is where we ultimately put our trust. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he concluded this hadith. This hadith, he says, وَإِنْ أَصَابَكَ شَيْءٌ فَلَا تَقُلْ لَوْ it says if something afflicts you, if something befalls you, you know, you, you, were out, you set out to do something, and along the way, hardship came, an affliction came, do not say if. Do not say if. Do not doubt. Right? Do not begin to doubt Allah's decree. He says, Lo anni fa'altu kada kada wa kada. Don't say if I would have done this, this would have happened. If I've done this, this would have happened. Don't say that. ولكن قل قدر الله or قدر الله ما شاء فعل فإن لو تفتح عمل الشيطان then say what Allah has decreed it certainly is as this word لو if I would have done this opens the doors to the shaytan وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وآخر الدعوة الحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خيرا